Welcome, and thank you very much for that warm introduction, Mike. As Mike mentioned, my name is Paul Cahan, and I am delighted to be with you virtually this evening to talk about the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant. I always like to start these talks with a little vignette from the end of Grant's presidency. In December 1867, shortly before leaving office after two terms as president, Grant transmitted his annual report to Congress. Uh, this is somewhat similar to today's State of the Union, except that it was delivered written rather than the president going to Congress and delivering it orally. Buried deep in the report uh, was a statement that Grant had made. Mistakes have been made as all can see and as I willingly admit. Now think about that for a minute. Imagine the President of the United States getting up in his annual uh, message before Congress and saying, God, we really screwed things up and you can all see that. I mean, it simply wouldn't happen. The building could be going up in flames behind him and the President would say, well, it's been a little warm recently, but I am confident we are about to turn the corner. I mean, this is just something the politicians then and certainly politicians now didn't do. And it gives a sense, I think, of the ways in which Grant broke the mold of what we think of as a politician, but also brings us back to that reputation for corruption and scandal that I think really envelops Grant's presidency. And tonight I hope to dispel, dispel some of the myths about Grant as president. Now, a lot of times people ask me why I chose to write this book. And it's actually a very long story that hopefully I'll be able to compress into a few sound bites. Uh, after I finished my fifth book, Amiable Scoundrel, The Life and Time, uh, Amiable Scoundrel, Simon Cameron, Lincoln's Scandalous Secretary of War, the finest book about Simon Cameron, um, I recognized that there was a shortage of material on Grant. And in fact, as I was researching that book, I was disappointed by the fact that there was no single volume history of Grant's presidency. Oh, there are plenty of fantastic biographies but they give relatively short shrift to Grant's presidency, preferring instead to spend most of their time focused on the war years. And that's a really odd omission because of course Grant was president for twice as many years as the Civil War was going on. And it made researching my book on uh, Simon Cameron very difficult because Cameron played a key role in the Senate during Grant's presidency eventually ascending to the chairmanship of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, then as now the most prestigious Senate committee uh, in uh, Congress. And so it was really frustrating that relatively little had been written about Grant's presidency. And I knew I needed a single volume history that introduced me to the main issues, that laid out the most important characters, and described the key events. And uh, I was complaining about this uh, as I was researching that book. And my wife, to her great credit, did not say, you should write that book, having learned her lesson from Amiable Scoundrel. But uh, I nonetheless decided that that book needed to be written. And so I called some new materials, uh, did some additional research. And about two years after Amiable Scoundrel was published, uh, we had um, the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant. And Grant's presidency is a really key turning point in American history. Grant is far and away the most important Reconstruction president in U.S. history. Yeah, you've got Johnson in there for two years. And yeah, you've got Rutherford B. Hayes at the end for about 15 minutes. But for most of Reconstruction, Grant is president of the United States. And he is, in consultation with his cabinet and in negotiations with Congress, setting and executing Reconstruction policy. And I think the Reconstruction is that element of the Civil War that often, too, gets short shrift. But if we accept Clausewitz's dictum that war is politics by other means, I think we have to accept the reverse. That in the case of Reconstruction, it is the, it is the continuation of the war via political means. And so Grant's presidency sheds a lot of um, light on this really key moment that I think all too often we ignore seeing, believing as we do that once the, the guns at Appomattox fall silent, the war is over. What I hope to convince you of is that the war continues for more than a decade after the war's conclusion. Now, you may ask yourself, how is it that Grant has sort of fallen into this memory hole? Because of course you know that there is a bookshelf of books of fine biographies about Grant, uh, books about his generalship, books about his tactics, um, but again, relatively little information about his presidency. And I think on some level, Grant has nobody to blame but himself. If you read Grant's memoirs, 
which are the standard by which presidential memoirs are judged, they end in 1865. It's as if Grant wanted to pretend that he didn't live another 20 years, eight of them as president of the United States, that he didn't make a fortune, lose a fortune, travel the world meeting heads of state. It's almost as if once the war is over, Grant just wants to curl onto his deathbed and wait for the cancer to get him. Uh, and it's a really striking omission. And it sets the tone for a lot of the history that ultimately follows. Um, and that's key moment is Reconstruction. Um, there is no coherent plan for Reconstruction. Surely you know that the Lincoln administration, to the degree that it had a plan for Reconstruction, found itself increasingly at loggerheads with Congress over the plan for the war, beginning in 1864 and continuing in 1865. Once Lincoln dies, it elevates Andrew Johnson to the presidency. And Johnson's in a really bizarre position. He has no political constituency of his own. He was chosen for the vice presidency largely as a response to critics of the administration who claimed that it was a Republican war. Lincoln actually runs on a union ticket and picking a prominent unionist Democrat really reinforced the administration's claims that this wasn't a partisan war, it was a war for all Americans. But Lincoln had no real consultation with Johnson. On some level, he didn't even really like Johnson. And Johnson plays absolutely no role in the administration's policies in the lead up to Lincoln's assassination. But what Johnson desperately wants is to be elected to the presidency in his own right. And that means building a political constituency. Now, Johnson's an old school Democrat, which means that he wants to ally the Southern whites with the white working class in the North. That's his bread and butter. This is the group that is going to propel him to the White House in his own right, just as it's the group that propelled Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren and most of the Democrats throughout the 1830s and 1840s. And so Johnson sets about trying to rebuild that coalition. And he does it by implementing ever, in, ever more lenient standards for readmission to the Union. Johnson takes a very hard line with wealthy Southerners because he has a chip on his shoulder having grown up poor. But for your average Confederate, he is more than willing to issue pardons and restore their voting rights. And as we get into 1866 and 1867, he's even willing to uh, redeem wealthy former Confederates, high uh, government officials, uh, leading military uh, officers, etc. And this presents a really profound challenge to the Republican Party which in 1866 and 1867 is going through its own identity crisis. Because you see, the Republican Party was not what we think of as a political party, the sort of stable, coherent organization composed of a variety of different factions that more or less get together and, and build a stable organization. The Republican Party was less than 20 years old uh, when, uh, at the election of 1868. And it was bound together largely by those people opposed to slavery. And on a spectrum, you have people over here who are saying things like, well, I don't really like slavery. I don't want it to expand. Um, but the Congress can't do anything where it already exists. And people over on this extreme are saying, we need to abolish slavery yesterday. And what keeps them together through the 1850s and the 1860s is the war. The war really unifies the Republican Party in a way that nothing else could have, particularly after 1863, when the war overtly becomes a war against slavery. But once the guns at Appomattox fall silent, Republicans turn around and say, well, do we need a Republican Party anymore? We've gotten rid of slavery, which was our single issue that we that had united us. Can't we now go back to being Whigs and know-nothings and Democrats? And there are a large number of Republicans who say, absolutely, this was a temporary expedient. We were not trying to build a new political party. But what gives the Republicans a second lease on life is opposition to Andrew Johnson, who they see as squandering the gains of the war. Yes, the, the, the federal government won the war, but Southern whites are winning the peace. And it's that outrage that brings that large tent of people who really don't have a whole lot of things 
in common and fuses a Republican coalition. And they're very successful in pushing back against Johnson's uh, reconstruction policies to the point where in 1868, uh, Johnson retains his presidency largely at the behest of congressional Republicans who basically say, you can keep the White House, but you're not going to have any power. We're going to run things from here on out. And that's a really bold statement. That's a really bold moment in American history. It's a moment where Congress is reasserting its authority against the executive in a way that we had never seen up to that point and we don't really see again in US history. But again, you have this highly factionalized Republican Party. They don't really have a platform. They're not really sure what they stand for. And so they know they have to win the 1868 presidential election in order to ensure the continuation of Reconstruction. But who can their nominee be? Who is the nominee that's going to be acceptable to your former Whigs and your former Democrats and your former know-nothings? The answer is Ulysses S. Grant. Grant has a lot of great things going for him in 1868. For one thing, he's the most popular man in America, north of the Mason-Dixon. But the cool thing about south of the Mason-Dixon is they don't get to vote. Um, for former Democrats, they can point to the fact that he, Grant has voted exactly once in his life, and it was for James Buchanan in 1856, that monument of American presidents, perhaps the greatest of American presidents. Grant does say later on that he highly regretted that decision. <laughs> Grant's political heroes are Whigs, Zachary Taylor and Winfield, Hanke and Winfield Scott, both who run for the presidency as Whigs. So for the former Whigs in the Republican Party, they can point to Grant's Whiggish sentiments as proof of uh, uh, his, his uh, uh, acceptability. And then of course, there's the know-nothings the anti-Catholic bigots who can point to Grant briefly flirting with the know-nothings as proof that he's a bigot just like all of us. So basically Grant is a Rorschach test that all of these various Republican factions can see themselves in him. And Grant is quite judicious during the 1868 campaign. He doesn't campaign. He allows his surrogates to speak for him. He makes no promises other than his campaign slogan, which is, let us have peace. What does that mean exactly? It doesn't really matter. Best not to ask too many questions. And as a result, Grant wins the presidency in a landslide. And so he comes into the presidency uh, uh, feeling as though he's going to be the non-political politician, that he owes no debts to anyone. And Grant here is engaging in a little bit of magical thinking. No man in history has ever had the presidency fall on him like an anvil from the sky. You know, this is sort of the wily coyote uh, uh, belief among presidents, that they, that they can become president without being politicians. Grant has great political uh, instincts in 1868. He keeps his mouth shut. He lets the surrogates speak for him. But believing that he's going to come into the White House, <clears throat> excuse me, without any debts to any politicians is a huge mistake. And we can see this in Grant building out his cabinet. He fills his cabinet with solid Republicans, none of whom are acceptable to the various factions of the Republican Party. And so as a result, Grant antagonizes almost every congressional Republican in 1869 with his choices of cabinets. And his legislation, his legislative agenda stalls in 1869 because of it. In fact, the single greatest achievement of Grant's first year in office is an exercise in raw executive power. And that's his response to the gold panic of 1869. And this is a really fun money nerd story. And I don't know if you guys know this about me, but I'm a huge money nerd. Because when we talk about money, what we're really talking about is politics. And I want to give you an illustration of that by this gold panic. After the war, of course, during the war, Sam and Chase had uh, basically financed the war through a variety of different instruments, one of which was printing paper money. And Americans have a deeply felt aversion to paper money that goes back to the revolution. 
In fact, if you want a great book that discusses the history of Americans' aversions to paper money, check out my book on the bank war, which outlines why this is and, and how it ends up uh, impacting policy. But in any event, for our purposes, there are all these newfangled innovations during the war. After the war ends, the hard money faction of the Republican Party, the people that say, oh my God, you can't have paper money. The only real money is gold demand that the administration begin retiring the paper money. So literally what begins happening is the government starts selling its stockpiles of gold and buys back all this paper money and then burns the paper money. It's contracting the money supply. There's literally less money in circulation. In addition, the government starts cutting its expenses wildly. It starts shrinking the uh, number of troops in the army. It starts uh, selling off a lot of its military surplus equipment. Um, it starts really tightening the belt. And as a result, uh, the price of gold begins creeping up in terms of how much paper money it's worth. Because of course, uh, uh, it's money is becoming scarce and the price of gold begins going up. Well, two New York financiers, Jay Gould and James Fisk, recognize that this is an opportunity to make a lot of money. Because if they begin buying up gold and taking it off the market, that'll further accelerate the price increases. By making gold more scarce, by taking it out of the market, you can push up the price. And if you do enough of that, then when the price hits a, a ceiling that you want to hit it with, you dump that gold in there at a much higher price than you paid for it, and you pocket the chain, the difference. The problem is, if you do that, you will cause the economy to collapse. Now, interestingly enough, there's only one person who can possibly foil this fiendish plot. No, it's not Batman it's Ulysses S. Grant. Because Grant, in controlling the US Treasury, has access to most of the gold in the United States. He's got enough gold that if he wants to dump it onto the market, he can quickly deflate the price of gold before Gould and Fisk can react, thereby leaving them holding their gold, but it's, only, it's worth much less than they paid for it. So, Fisk and Gould go out of their way to try to nail Grant down. They try to get him uh, to promise that he won't do this. But then, of course, they can't just go up to him and be like, hey, President Grant, we're doing crimes. Um, would you promise not to stop us? Um, and so they start hanging out with Grant and Grant's hangers on in the spring and summer of 1869. And Grant can't stand them. He blows them off a bunch of times. So they begin looking for an ally. And they find it in the person of a failed newspaper man uh, named Abel Corbin. Now, Abel Corbin's kind of a schmuck. He doesn't have a whole lot going for him except one thing. He's married to Grant's sister. And so as a result, Grant can't really blow him off. So Gould and Fisk bring uh, Corbin into the plan. They basically say, this is what we're going to do. We need you to get the president to agree not to sell gold. But again, Corbin can't t explain why he doesn't want Grant to sell gold. He just wants him to make a public statement that he's not going to sell gold. And throughout the summer and autumn of 1869, um, he's constantly besieging Grant saying, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And finally, Grant clues in that something is going on. The price of gold is going up. Uh, Corbin is bugging him. These guys, Gould and Fisk, always seem to be around. And so Grant turns to the Secretary of the Treasury and says, dump the gold. And as a result, they managed to head off a panic uh, in the gold market by flooding the market with gold. The price collapses before Gould and Fisk are able to corner the market and sell their shares. Gould and Fisk get out, um, but there's no economy-wide panic. Uh, and it's a really great illustration of Grant's decisive action. But it's totally an exercise of raw executive power. He doesn't ask Congress. He doesn't ask the judiciary. This is Grant acting on his own. And I think about that same time, Grant begins recognizing that he can't run the country without the legislative branch. He really needs to get them off the bench and get them engaged. But again, the Republican Party, which controls Congress, is horribly factionalized. And getting into bed with one faction necessarily means antagonizing the other factions. And so Grant looks around and says, all right, who in Congress are the people who can get things done, that can move my legislative agenda? 
And he settles on the people that he sees getting things done. The Roscoe Conklings of New York, the Simon Camerons of Pennsylvania. Um, and he says, these are my guys, the spoils men, the men who have built state level political machines through the judicious use of patronage, through the judicious distribution of government contracts. Um, these are the people that can deliver the votes to move my legislative agenda. And so in 1870, he actually goes to, he goes fishing with Simon Cameron uh, on Cameron's, uh, one of Cameron's estates in middle Pennsylvania. He goes in thinking that Cameron is a scumbag and he's not gonna like him, but actually they become very close friends. And he sees in Cameron a, a person in the Senate who can be a steward of Grant's legislative agenda. Because Grant has a really ambitious legislative agenda. He wants to totally reorient relations with uh, Native Americans. He wants to annex Santa Domingo, today's Dominican Republic, as a haven for newly freed uh, ex-slaves. Um, and he wants to basically prosecute reconstruction to prevent the South from winning the peace. I mean, these are big ticket items and he needs advocates in Congress. However, crawling into bed with the spoils men gives Grant a reputation for corruption, number one, and antagonizes a really important Senate faction headed by um, Senator Charles Sumner. Now, of course, all of you know Charles Sumner. I mean, this man is a living legend. He literally bleeds for the cause of abolition after being caned on the floor of the Senate. He is just a living monument to all that is good and righteous in the Republican Party. He's also kind of a dick. And Grant recognizes this. Grant cannot stand him. He finds him to be pretentious, obnoxious, and while he's got, you know, he's, he's, you know, sort of this, this great intellectual and this, you know, the moral voice of the party, he's standing in Grant's way, particularly when it comes to the annexation of Santo Domingo. Um, Sumner is highly offended that Grant didn't name him Secretary of State, believing that he had a right to that office, um, given that he was probably the most senior Republican foreign policy intellectual um, in the party at that time. But Grant couldn't stand him, and he couldn't stand the people in Sumner's entourage, and they are shut out of the really plum diplomatic positions. And so Sumner, out of a mixture of peak and I guess uh, philosophy, uh, decides that he is going to hold up uh, treaty negotiations with Santa Domingo. The Grant administration actually gets a treaty on, in hand to annex Santo Domingo. They negotiate a price, Grant takes it to the Senate and says, here it is, let's go on, and Sumner derails it. And in fact, Sumner derails it twice. And it's at that point that Grant goes from actively disliking Sumner to hating Sumner. In fact, one of Grant's friends talks about walking around Washington with the president. Uh, and Grant walks by Sumner's house and uh, shakes his fist at Sumner's window and says, no man has ever abused me more than the man that lives up there. Think about that. Think about Ulysses S. Grant pointing to Sumner's house and saying, that man has abused me more than any other. I mean, it gives you a sense of the visceral hatred that Grant had for Sumner. And so as a result, Grant decides to go around him. Uh, he works with his Republican faction in the Senate to depose Sumner. Sumner actually loses his chairmanship of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, and uh, he's replaced by Simon Cameron, who of course becomes a willing and, a and able advocate of the administration's policies. Um, but unfortunately, Grant is never able to annex Santa Domingo. He has more success reorienting uh, relations with Native Americans. Um, Grant argues that the current system of Indian agents, where you have these federal government employees who basically live with Native Americans on the reservations and are supposed to act as conduits before, between the federal government and the natives and vice versa. He's horribly corrupt. He's absolutely right. And so he says, I'm going to fire all of these people and I'm going to replace them with Quakers and evangelical Christians because those people I know will act morally and will not take advantage of Native Americans. And this ruffles quite a few feathers because, of course, these Indian agent gigs are great patronage positions. They pay well. There's all kinds of opportunity for graft and corruption. 
But Grant moves ahead with this. And ultimately, by 1872, the number of uh, military conflicts between Native Americans and the U.S. Army actually declines considerably. We never get to zero. But this policy of treating Native Americans better and improving the, the, the conduits between the natives and the federal government actually pays some dividends. And then, of course, there's Reconstruction. Grant is incredibly aggressive in, during his first term in supporting the rights of newly freed uh, African Americans in the South. He forms the Department of Justice in order to ensure that African Americans' uh, rights are being protected. And using uh, the authority granted the executive under the force bills, he destroys, destroys the Ku Klux Klan, a white terrorist organization designed to intimidate Southern Republicans and African Americans. The Klan is destroyed. It eventually experiences a renaissance in the 1920s, um, but it's a very different organization than the organization that we see in the 1870s. And so cruising into his re-election campaign in 1872, Grant has chalked up a number of successes. Yeah, he didn't get Santa Domingo, but Reconstruction is moving along smoothly. Southern states are re-entering the Union under uh, Republican governments that are more or less committed to protecting the rights of African Americans. The number of violent conflicts between whites and natives has dropped. He's headed off uh, the economic collapse of the United States, and he's got a solid working coalition in the Senate and the, and the House that's giving him the legislation that he wants. <laughs> And as a result, Grant wins by a landslide during the 1872 election. He cruises to a second term. But as Grant is quick to discover, as many presidents discover, first terms are normally a whole lot better than second terms. Second terms tend to be when the bodies resurface and voter fatigue with the incumbent really begins to kick in. Um, and it's interesting that at Grant's inauguration, you get sort of a, a presage of this. Um, Grant is, uh, inaugurations at this time take place in March, which is usually fairly warm in Washington. There's a freak cold snap the week of Grant's administration. And so as a result, the cadets marching in uh, the inaugural parade actually get frostbite and some of the, several of them lose digits. The inaugurational ball takes place in this huge wooden building that was uh, built for the occasion. But because it was supposed to take place in a relatively warm climate, there was no insulation. A woman actually drops dead on the dance floor um, due to hypothermia. And the climax of the inaugural ball was supposed to be at midnight, the release of all of these doves that were supposed to fly down from the ceiling and sort of inaugurate the let us have peace theme. The cage is open at midnight and the crowd is showered by thousands of, canary, of, of uh, corpses. Um, it is a, an awful beginning to Grant's second term and things get a whole lot worse. Um, Grant's commanding re-election victory, uh, I think overshadows several really key factors about his victory. One is Grant is much more popular personally than the Republican Party generally or Republican policies specifically. He's winning on a sort of cult of personality platform, which is fine when things are going well. But in 1873, the economy collapses due to the Panic of 1873. Um, the Panic of 1873 is a great, another one of these great money nerd things. It has to do with the mining of silver. Silver was discovered in Nevada in the mid 1860s. And so as a result, you get this rush of train building out to Nevada so that you can get this silver out of, the, uh, out of uh, Nevada, get it either to the east so it can be exported to Europe or out to California so it can be exported to China. And so as a result, you get this massive proliferation of railroads all converging on places like Carson City, Nevada. And they become these huge boom towns. And all of these railroads are issuing bonds and everybody's making money. And it's great until in 1871, Germany demonetizes silver, followed by the US Congress in 1873. Henceforth, the, the US Mint will no longer mint coins made out of silver. They will only mint coins made out of gold. 
As a result, the value of silver drops. As a result, the demand for silver drops. As a result, the amount of traffic on the railroads connecting Nevada to the civilized world collapses. And as a result, all of these railroads collapse. And the Panic of 1873 initiates a Great Depression sized depression that actually lasts longer than the Great Depression of the 1930s. It is longer, it is more severe, and it is devastating across the board. It's devastating to Reconstruction because Congress immediately cuts, uh, makes even more draconian cuts to the number of soldiers in the US Army. And these are the people who are enforcing Reconstruction in the South. It is devastating to uh, Republican unity because you've got these hard money people in the Republican Party who are saying things like, we just gotta keep, the, we just gotta keep buying greenbacks. We gotta keep burning them. Gold is the only money. And the other faction of the Republican Party who says, whoa, guys, chill out. We need some liquidity. Let's take some of those greenbacks and pump them into the economy. And let's do some other things. Um, and Grant comes down on the wrong side of this issue. He doubles down on uh, not remonetizing silver and not re-inflating the currency with paper money. And as a result, his popularity takes a huge hit, particularly among white voters in the North who had been more or less willing to go along with Reconstruction in the South as long as they had full bellies and jobs to go to and their families were being taken care of. But now, every dollar that's being spent on Reconstruction is a dollar of tax money that's not being spent on them. Every dollar of money that's being spent on this newfangled policy of dealing with Native Americans is a dollar that's not being spent on them. And as a result, Grant cruises into his second term handicapped. The best that he can do is consolidate the gains that he made in his first term. And there are no new policy, there are no new bold policy initiatives in the second term. In fact, things go from bad to worse when in the election of 1874, Democrats take control of the House of Representatives for the first time since the war. Now, I need you to put on your thinking caps for just a minute because you're gonna to have to imagine this and it's gonna be hard. Imagine an unpopular president who loses control of the House of Representatives. I mean, I know this is, this is hard. You're gonna to have to wrap your heads around. What might that look like? What might that do to the country? What might that do to the president's agenda? There would probably be investigations. There would probably be a great unwillingness to give the executive the funds it wants to implement its policies. There would probably be a general unwillingness to work with the executive. I know, mind blowing. It's, it's incredibly difficult. It's hard for you to wrap your head around, but this is the challenge that Grant faces in his last two years as president. The House of Representatives uh, initiates a lot of investigations of rumors of corruption in the Grant administration. Now, there had been rumors about Grant administration corruption, particularly as we get into the second term. There had been a lot of turnover in the cabinet. Um, several members of the cabinet were incompetent. Some of them were just corrupt. Um, and so as a result, the House really begins digging in. And the Democrats in the House are very, very clever. They don't do this all at once. It's a drip, drip, drip of scandal. It's all of these investigations digging into what did the president know and, and when did he know it. And as a result, it really erodes Grant's credibility. So not only is the country mired in this incredibly devastating economic collapse, but now the president's moral authority and political standing are being eroded by these investigations, some of which are legitimate. There is undeniable corruption in Grant's administration, not in, on his part, but on members who were using their positions and their, uh, um, their, their placement near him to enrich themselves. But some of these are just political scandals. And in the fog of scandal that just keeps exploding onto newspapers, how do you tell the difference? And for the House Democrats, it doesn't really matter because the end game isn't, prevent, isn't to prove any of these things. The end game is to hobble Grant, 
moving into the 1876 presidential election and ultimately prevent the Republicans from electing their nominee, Rutherford B. Hayes. And so as a result, 1875 and 1876 are Grant's worst years in the presidency. In fact, he calls the day that he leaves the presidency in March 18, 1877 the happiest day of his life um, because of just how awful the last two years are. He sees a lot of his gains disappear. Um, his policy against the Native Americans becomes a casualty of tough choices. Um, when gold is discovered in the Black Hills in the summer of 1876, Grant is faced with a really difficult choice. On the one hand, the federal government had promised, had sworn up and down to the natives in that area, we will not take this land from you. If you move to this crappy land that nobody wants, where nothing can grow, we will leave you alone. And so as a result, you know, you have thousands upon thousands of natives living there on land that they were promised would be theirs in perpetuity. And then gold is discovered. And so as a result, Grant's faced with a choice. Do I honor my promises to the Native Americans or do I take this quick infusion of gold that can right the economy just in maybe in time for the election? And as you might imagine, the U.S. gets the gold and the Indians get the shaft. And in fact, the Sioux sue the United States government and it makes it all the way to the Supreme Court because the federal government offers them money. And the Indians say, no, 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 we want our land, we want our land, we want our land. And in fact, in 1980, the Supreme Court says, you're never getting the land back, take the money. And to this day, the Sioux have refused to take the money. It's still sitting in an account uh, in, in their name, accruing interest to this day. So in a lot of ways, Grant's policies, his signature policies become casualties of the deteriorating political and economic situation. And in fact, in the 1876 presidential election, the Republicans nearly lose the election. Rutherford B. Hayes is nearly bested by um, the, the Democratic nominee, Samuel Tilden. And it's really only some very shady maneuvers on the Republicans' part that allow, to, that allow um, Hayes to win the presidency and become president. And it's rumored, though it's never been proven, that, that um, Hayes does this in exchange for a promise to end Reconstruction by ordering the remnants of the U.S. troops in the South back to their bases. Uh, I think it's likely that that wasn't a promise, but ultimately it doesn't matter because Reconstruction had been sputtering for years. The casualty of ongoing budget cuts, um, Northern white apathy, and unified Southern resistance to uh, Reconstruction. And so as a result, Grant leaves office seeing much of the things that he had fought for and that he had run for president in 1868 to achieve going up in flames. That being said, Grant's presidency is a mixed bag. And so you have to ask yourself, why do we have this really negative view of Grant's presidency? Where did that come from? Well, this is really a historian nerd question and it comes down to this. Historians are constrained by the sources that we have at our disposal. And Grant's papers are not published until beginning until the 1960s, whereas his enemies' papers go into print almost immediately in the 1870s, the 1880s, the 1890s. You have memoirs, you have autobiographies, you have collections of letters being published. People like Sumner, people like Sumner's ally Carl Schurz. Well, if all you have are the uh, uh, letters and diaries and documents generated by Grant's political enemies, what is that story going to look like? It's, of course, going to look like Grant is an ineffectual buffoon who can't, uh, uh, who who's, uh, uh, was just totally outmatched by the presidency. In addition, Beginning in the 1880s and the 1890s, as the Civil War sort of, sort of be, as the Civil War generation begins dying off and the war itself sort of re, uh, recedes into the hazy fog of memory, you get this sort of reconceptualization about the war. The war stops being a war about slavery, where one side was, was right and one side was wrong. It sort of becomes this big camping expedition with guys in blue and guys in gray. And what was it really over? Oh, it doesn't really matter. It was just, you know, a big old camping expedition with a bunch of shared experiences. 
And in fact, you can see this in the footage of the 50th reunion at Gettysburg, where you have these little old Confederate veterans hobbling across the field, and these little old Union veterans hobbling out across the field, and when they meet each other, they embrace. Well, in that embrace, there is no room for the story about slavery. There is no room for the story about African Americans. There is no room for the story about white terrorism against Southern blacks and Republican office holders. And that all gets swept away. And in fact, the, the, you know, one of the greatest movies ever made comes out at just about this time. And it's of course, uh, it's based on a book called The Klansman. And it's, um, Woodrow Wilson calls it writing history with lightning, birth of a nation. It changes the genre of movie making. No one had ever seen anything like this. These sweeping panoramic battles, these uh, beautiful sets, these casts of thousands. It just happens to be racist trash. But it's racist trash that reinforces a belief about Reconstruction, that the problem with Reconstruction was it went too far too fast, that Blacks were not ready for self-government. Well, if the problem with Reconstruction is it went too far and too fast, Grant's a villain, because of course he was pushing for um, Reconstruction and for the enfranchisement of African Americans. And this view is locked down in, in uh, later movies like Gone with the Wind, where of course Union soldiers are these rapey villains and, and slaves are, are, are buffoons who are incapable of self-government. So you have these two uh, um, developments that reinforce this idea of Grant as a, a, a zealot, a buffoon, a schmuck. Fast forward in the 1960s and you get a new generation of scholars who goes back and looks at Reconstruction and says, well, well wait a minute. <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, Recon the problem with Reconstruction was not that it went too far too fast. The problem with Reconstruction is it didn't go far enough. That if the federal government had really doubled down on efforts to protect African Americans and to make good the promises of freedom, that uh, uh, Reconstruction would have been a, a, su a successful experiment. Well, in that narrative, Who's to blame for that failure? Well, of course, it's Ulysses S. Grant, President of the United States. He didn't go far enough. He didn't push hard enough. So you have these two competing narratives, both of which agree on one fact, and that's that Grant uh, was a buffoon. Grant was a schmuck. Grant didn't, was a failed president. And it's only with the publication of Grant's papers, and we only get the presidential papers beginning in the 1990s, that you begin to see an alternative vision come out where Grant is honestly trying to do the best that he can do amidst diminishing resources and against really difficult odds. Uh, Grant's wife's memoir, Julia Grant's diary, isn't published till 1979. And so it should come as no surprise that as we moved into the 90s and then the early 2000s, scholarly thinking on Grant changed radically. Look, I'm not trying to convince you that Ulysses S. Grant was Abraham Lincoln, but he sure as hell wasn't James Buchanan. Thank you all very much. I'm happy to answer questions.